I'm Shane Morris. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, Colson Fellows Director Bill Brown interviews Pastor Chris Brooks about his landmark book, Urban Apologetics, Why the Gospel is Good News for the City. Pastor Brooks, who is also a member of the Colson Center Board of Directors, discusses a wide range of issues facing the urban church, including criminal justice, abortion, fatherhood and family, and economic development. The interview was part of a Colson Fellows webinar. To learn more about the Colson Fellows program, go to colsonfellows.org. Here are Bill Brown and Pastor Chris Brooks. Everybody's read your book, Urban Apologetics, as part of the curriculum. And I told you before, I, I confessed a bit, actually, I thought I had figured out all about what the urban, what people in the urban environment needed to do in order to get out of the, the slog and the morass and the swamp in which they live. I had all these policies, I had all these statistics, all these data, until I got involved with the inner city through various ministries and getting students involved and and so on. And I felt, number one, I was embarrassed uh, by what I used to think. I was humiliated in some ways, actually, but I was so blessed by what I found by people there. Can you talk about that just a little bit, how difficult it is and how it is? I, I think you said something about like hiding behind the data or something like that, which is we, we tend to do that a lot. You know? Yeah, well, you know, the reality is, is that one of the things I'm most excited about, Bill, is the rise of scholarship uh, as it pertains to urban ministry. For years and years and years, urban ministry was uh, was happening, but I would argue not taken seriously. There were always those outliers that helped to uh, bring some attention to it, Ray Bakke being one and John Perkins being another, but the number was small and few. The fact of the matter is, is that broadly evangelical higher ed institutions, Bible colleges, uh, my very own Moody Bible Institute that I appreciate, love and work with, uh, others, Wheaton College, uh, Cedarville, uh, there's a number of uh, schools that brought me in and others that have launched ca- classes, courses. And so I'm glad to say that more and people are learning about what urban ministry looks like. There are a lot of uh, false assumptions, and we need to have more conversations like we're having tonight so that we can get to know what is unique about urban ministry that makes it different the suburban ministry, what makes it different than even rural ministry. You and I talked about that. There are a lot of uh, distinctions that mm-hmm. are important to highlight. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wrote this book about three and a half years ago, and Detroit has been on some arc. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, but you're right in the middle of it. Yeah. So as, as everybody's read this book and they've understood what you've been saying, what has changed in uh, Detroit and the environment in which you live over the last three and a half, four years? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of exciting things about Detroit. Praise God, none of our public officials are under federal investigation or indictment currently, which is always a win. Uh, so I just say that as an aside, some of you know what I'm talking about. If you're in cities or states where there seems to be con- consistent political upheaval, there's been political stability, but it doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. What I am grateful for is there is a real passion for church planning a rise of ministry activity. Uh, There is a tremendous movement of racial reconciliation and ministry happening together. But let me just use Detroit as a microcosm and go from there and expand to the broader question of what's changed in urban America since I've written this book. And I think a number of things have changed. Let me just give you three, one good, one bad, one neutral. Now I can give you about 30 things that have changed because Uh, Things have changed more in the past three to four years in my city of Detroit uh, and in other urban inner city areas than I would argue, Bill, have changed in a generation. It just is moving so rapidly. Technology plays into that, economics, politics, political landscape, so much. But the good is this, the fact that, again, as I said earlier, a rise in urban scholarship and attention to urban ministry. Uh, There is just a huge number of ministries that have arisen that are doing great work. Uh, One of the examples of that is CCDA, Christian Community Development Association, again, headed up by uh, John Perkins and, and others. They're doing a great job in pumping out ministries that are committed to not only doing urban ministry, but doing urban ministry that's effective. 
That's not just switching people's dependency from the government to the local church, but helping them to experience self-sustainability. I think that's a positive move. I mentioned church planning. Just about every denomination I know, church planning organization I know, has a, a specific strategy for targeting urban inner city areas from St. Louis to inner city Atlanta to L.A. to Detroit to Camden, New Jersey. I could tell you of church planners I know that are there and thriving. So I praise God for the support and resources that are pouring in. What's bad is the fact that there is a continued gulf that has been created between what has been traditionally called the evangelical church, which is predominantly demographically, ethnically, racially white. And new reports by the Pew Research Center uh, will show that the number of blacks who identify as evangelicals is at a historic low in this country. Uh, many of them have either gone to historically black denominations, the largest of which is the National Baptist denomination, you have Church of God in Christ. You have AME, African Methodist Episcopal. Uh, those are the top three. There are others, but those are the top three denominations that are historically black, started by African-American church leaders, uh, committed to black uplift in the community. And some others who have left evangelical churches have just simply left the local church altogether. They've uh, unaffiliated from, with the local church. And we should be concerned about this. I think mm -hmm. our pol entrenched political, partisan political views have unfortunately superseded our commitment to the gospel. And this is across the spectrum. No group has a corner on this across the spectrum. And I think it has caused us to experience a hyper polarization. And uh, that continues to be a concern for those of us who understand that Christ has called us to reconcile men and women to him and in Christ to one another. The church should be a countercultural faith community where we experience healing. The neutral point, Bill and others, is uh, the rise of Gen Z. Gen Z was not on the map when I wrote this book. There was no scholarship, no reporting on what we today identify as our middle schoolers and high schoolers. Recently, Barna Research Group, along with this wonderful group out of uh, Atlanta, Impact 360, handed up by Jonathan Morrow, just released a report that details from Sim to Stern, uh, Gen Z, who they are demographically. They're going to be not only the largest demographic in American history, but they are the most diverse. The first time ever America is going to have a majority minority population, the majority of uh, First graders now are ethnic minorities in this country, and uh, that has huge ramifications for the church and I think uh, great possibilities as well. But there's just, again, I'm, I'm saying this as a neutral, there's a lot of things we're learning about Gen Z, and many of us are just wrapping our minds around millennials, and now we got to get ready for Gen Z, but it's exciting. Mm. Well, I, I agree, and uh, I'm very involved with Access, you know, Access.org, and they yes. they try to keep their finger on the pulse of that, and it is it is a moving target. I mean, it is really something that um, is challenging culturally in ways we just haven't uh, been able to do before. Because you know, you've you've heard me say the culture reboots itself now about every five years. It used to take 20, 25 years for a culture to yes. slowly turn over its communication technologies and its, its values and so on, but now it's so fast, it may be even faster faster than that. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your book that everybody's read. I was fascinated the first time I read this years ago, before I even met you, I was fascinated because you didn't have urban ministries or the, the, the urban plight or whatever. It's urban apologetics. Now, um, what was the focus uh, in your mind when you started writing the book here? And how, how was it intended to play out in the urban environment? Well, you know, we are just days away from MLK 50. So we uh, think about Martin Luther King Jr., his life, his legacy, his impact. On April 4th, the world is going to descend upon Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I'll be at Biola speaking to a group there. But we're reflecting on Dr. King. And I will say it all started for me by thinking about two quotes from Dr. King. One was this quote. And I'm often uh, noted as saying that what the world so desperately needs are tough-minded, tender-hearted Christians, right? He goes on to say in his book, Strength to Love, that the world will one day know 
that the heart can never be totally right when the mind is totally wrong. So my quest in urban apologetics was to say to the world that there are inner city uh, Christians and inner city life that is deeply intellectual and that the thought life of men and women drive their actions. Thoughts precede actions. And if we don't address uh, what's happening in urban America on a worldview level, uh, then we won't see change. And so often urban ministry is driven by uh, trends and fads. My hope was to be able to announce to the world that there was a lot of intellectual life that was there. And hopefully our approach to ministry would not just be driven by trends and fads, but deep consideration of the thought life of what's happening among urbanites. Uh, I love the book uh, for that reason, because you take specific issues that at the, in the larger sense are different when they get into the microcosm of the urban environment. And uh, so let's look at a couple of those if we could. The first is uh, the issue of abortion that you wrote a chapter on. How is abortion and the apologetical approach that you can have for abortion in the inner city, a way to communicate the, the love of Jesus Christ? Well, you know, this is my largest chapter, and it's my largest chapter in a lot of ways because of the intensity of this discussion. Um, the fight for autonomy for women is something that uh, transcends race in America in particular, and so much of the language of the pro-abortion movement, pro-choice movement, as, as it's called, a sense of freedom, liberation, uh, this, again, quest for autonomy, a woman's right to choose or to have control over her own body. But I think this takes on a unique narrative among African-American women when you add in the history of slavery, um, Jim Crow, the fact that women of color not only had to suffer the plight of all women, but the additional racial discriminations that came along with that. So you have to be sensitive to a group of individuals who have not had control over their own bodies for many, many years of American history. And so when we get to this point, we can't just simply dismiss that longing to have control, autonomy, when others were making decisions about what happened to your body, the appeal to a movement that says you can control your body is something that we would all be attracted to if we had the same narrative or experience. However, I do think that it is an opportunity for us to present the gospel because there is this dual movement, in particular in inner cities and African-American communities, of this deep love for our children, this deep desire to see our children fare well, this passion for life. And so I would simply say that we have to make sure we communicate a message that is equally concerned about the child as well as the mother, equally concerned about both. Uh, I think that at times the messaging of the pro-life movement in black communities has come across uh, and, and, and maybe even beyond, but I'm speaking specifically about inner city urban America has come across as a concern simply for children, but not about mothers. And we need to be more sensitive to that. We need to do more wraparound services. I think, Bill, the greatest thing that's happened, in my opinion, in the pro-life movement, in particular in inner cities, is the rise of pregnancy resource centers. The rise of pregnancy resource centers because they do wraparound services and they care as much for the mother as they do for the child. We are blessed at our church to have a care net center on our campus right there in the heart of inner city Detroit. And we're walking with moms and dads, mentoring them uh, some up to five years after the baby is born. So we're really mm -hmm. excited about that. Um, but I would also say that we have to make sure we're, we're sensitive to what Dr. King said in his letter from a Birmingham jail. He says his poor social analysis to only consider outcomes or symptoms without considering causal factors. And so we have to ask ourselves why are African-American women, uh, women of color, Latino women, those in poor urban inner cities, why are they perpetuating abortion so frequently? And I think when we get to causal factors, we understand that 
there's a worldview here that has to be challenged from pulpits and in families. Uh, but we also have to also understand that economic conditions matter. Educational opportunities matter. Those things matter in this whole equation. And then finally, I will say that we have to do deep analysis, Bill, on uh, who has the ear of uh, men and women in the inner city. And I will tell you that it's not just the pastor. If you're going to do an apologetic movement in the inner city, you better have barbers and beauticians on that list of people that you work closely with uh, because we believe in getting our hair done. And let me just tell you, I did years ago before I had kids. Those days are long behind me now. Uh, but I will say that you got to have barbers, you got to have beauticians, you got to have big mama on the plan, you, you got to have uncles, you, you got to have people who are social and cultural prophets, if you will, that have the ability to influence in ways that uh, I think are unique to inner city America. Shane Morris here again. I hope you're enjoying today's podcast. I want to let you know that we have Pastor Brooks' book, Urban Apologetics, available at our online bookstore. Simply come to breakpoint.org and click on store. Of course, we'll link you to it as well from our podcast page. Now back to Bill Brown and Chris Brooks. Let's expand that just a little bit because you mentioned ministering to mothers as well and yeah. to fathers. And the whole family issue uh, in the inner city is one that is a, an incredible challenge, not only for those uh, who are trying to get their hands on, whether it be education or whether it be social services or whatever, but the church itself. What are some of the issues there? And then just point it, how, how is your church addressing some of those? Yeah, so I, I, I write a lot about the family, and, and interestingly enough, when I wrote about the family, I quoted some of the stuff that Bill Cosby was doing at the time. You talk about how the world has changed since I wrote the book. Uh, Bill Cosby was the quintessential African-American father in the 80s. This was the family that not only African-Americans celebrated on the Cosby Show, but broadly America for many years running the Cosby Show was the picture of the American family, a dad who was a doctor, a mom who was a lawyer, kids who made mistakes, but all mistakes were fixed in 26 and a half minutes every week. And it was a perfect example of a family. Well, uh, since then, a lot of those images have been replaced by dysfunctionality. Uh, throughout America, we celebrate dysfunction. Now, the modern family has replaced the Cosby family. Uh, Roseanne Barr Show and others came along and celebrated dysfunction. And I think that continues to drive nihilism, this thought of desperation and hopelessness throughout the African-American community. There are uh, dropping marriage rates. Marriage is becoming less and less popular. I quote in the book, Brady Goodwin, who is a hip hop artist, and he writes a book that is entitled The Death of uh, Hip Hop, Marriage and Morals. And in it, he says this, he says it on page uh, 104 in the book, it says marriage is no longer desired or necessary. We have uh, a whole generation of kids who are growing up, many of which never saw their parents married at all. The neighborhood that I'm in, Bill, has a 70% female head of household without men that are there. So you're asking, what are we doing to address it? Well, a couple of things that we're doing to address it. We are celebrating the rise of marriage ministries that are targeting people of color, ethnic minorities. There are so many ministries that are doing a great job, but discipleship is the simple answer. It is discipleship uh, at an early age, helping to take boys and girls and walking with them there are no quick fixes, and this is true across America. Uh, it is specifically true in the inner city. We like to say this, Bill, about inner cities, that when broader America has a cold, the inner city has a flu. Uh, whatever problem you have in uh, broader America, it seems to be exacerbated in the inner city. We also have to work at criminal justice reform because far too many uh, men of color are incarcerated that should not have been incarcerated. There were so many tough on crime laws that were passed that did more harm than good. Three strike policy is an example of that, where someone could go away for drug possession 
uh, for life after being caught three times. Uh, and, and what you found is that not enough data was done on the healthcare deserts that existed in urban America. So a lot were doing drugs and passing those drugs along uh, as a way of self-medicating. Uh, I know a lot of uh, men who are serving Christ today that were dealing with anxiety disorders, that were dealing with uh, uh, depression or other mood disorders, that were using marijuana and other uh, narcotics as a way of coping with their condition back when, before marijuana becomes legalized in, in an industry, these were men who were being put in jail, young men who were being incarcerated for life. And so we have to analyze criminal justice. The other thing I will say about criminal justice reform is that we've created a permanent second class, a permanent poverty class for those who have done their time, who hopefully have come through the prison system and want to have a second chance at life. So one of the things we've opened on our campus at our church, Bill, is a transitional home for 26 men who are desiring a second chance at life. We're working with them to mentor them, disciple them, get them economic opportunities so that they can hopefully lead their families and be contributors to the church and to the community. And so I think discipleship is a big thing, making the discipleship of men as husbands and fathers the centerpiece of the church, the call to disciple men as the centerpiece of the church. This is no slight against women, but if you want to bless women and children, you better start with blessing men. And uh, we're doing that by discipling them as a central focus of our church's agenda. Mm. You know, I, I was uh, speaking in high school in the, uh in downtown Denver, actually, had been there for a while. We had a program there. I used to love going to the high school. Uh, it was a large, large class. And I asked, uh, what were their dreams? These were all uh, high school seniors, juniors and seniors. And uh, about half the guys wanted to be in the NBA. That was their <laughs> dream, the NBA. That's what they were headed for, they, they thought. And most of the girls, the first thing they said was, I want to have a baby. Hmm. And then life would go on. And then down the, lo the road and maybe get married, you know, and so, and yeah. uh, it was such an interesting thing where uh, everything seemed to be turned just a bit, but nobody, nobody flinched at all. It was just like, yeah, that's, that's the, those are the values of our culture. And you deal with that all the time. And so uh, when you talk about discipling men, how, how young, how old do you do uh, your discipleship with them? Yeah, right there in North Carolina, one of our former elders of our church leads a national movement, Carlos Johnson, and it's called the Future Man Program. And he starts with young men uh, as early as age five, helping them to understand what family is, helping them to experience that, uh, helping them to have visions for the future, uh, giving them mentors that are husbands and fathers themselves so they can see positive role models. The beautiful thing about The Cosby Show is that it was a nationally recognized show. The bad thing about it is that it was on TV. It was fictional. There was no one to touch, no one to hold, no one to walk with. Uh, mm -hmm. What we are trying to do across the nation is to bring those images to life, to a neighborhood near you. So mobilizing healthy uh, men, mobilizing models of family is really critical, really important. Uh, Eric Mason, I got to mention Eric Mason, who's out of Philadelphia, uh, who's doing a, a great job calling men to restore manhood. And this whole thought that every man has to disciple a boy. Uh, if you're not discipling a young man, you're not doing your job. It starts with your biological kids, obviously. But if you're in urban America, even if you don't have biological children, you become a surrogate dad, you, you become a mentor, you grab a young man and you say, I want to walk with you until Christ is formed in you. So I would say, Bill, the earlier, the better. Uh, work, working with men, walking with young men, and helping them to give vision and values that are based off of the gospel. And this is just a, a question that I hear from a lot of people uh, believers who feel a real urge to be involved in the inner city, but say, what can a white woman, white man 
contribute to the ministry in the inner city? Yeah, the list is long. I, I would I would just encourage number one to start after you've read uh, Urban Apologetics to uh, make sure that you do two things, two other resources. Brian Fickard's book, When Helping Hurts, is a very important book in this conversation. Uh, and then secondly, I mentioned ccda.org, the Christian Community Development Association. Even if you just look at their core values, that will help you. I think there's a number of things that we can do. Number one, I would say have as great a love for missions in urban inner cities as we do for global missions. Far too often we will get on planes and fly halfway across the world, but we won't do the same thing uh, 10, 15, 20 miles away from our own church. Oftentimes we despise local missions uh, through our actions and behaviors while celebrating global missions. So I would say number one, ask yourself before you get on that plane, are there groups that we can serve and help here locally? Secondly, everything flows from relationships. So those who are pastors, those who are business leaders, those who desire uh, to serve Christ should make as part of their relational plan to build a relationship with great urban ministry leaders. You can rally around. And if you know, I, I have a number of those relationships. So if somebody wants to send me an email and say, who's in my town? Uh, you know, there are a number of people across America that you can connect with. I would say the, the last thing, Bill, about this, and we could talk about each one of these for hours on the end. But the last thing I would say is honoring indigenous leadership. And what I mean by that is you don't have to go in as a white knight. And what I mean by that term is to think that you have to go and rescue uh, urban America. God is already at work. When we go into any city, any neighborhood, we don't bring Jesus to those neighborhoods. We discover what he's already doing. And as much as possible, we want to ask those indigenous leaders there how we can serve them and how we can help them in their quest to reach, disciple, and evangelize their own neighborhoods and their own communities. And I think that if we do that, then we'll see uh, revival, and we'll see wonderful bridges being built. But but don't think that uh, skin color determines where you can serve Christ. There is a need for a multi generational and multi cultural, multi ethnic movement in our inner cities. And I praise God that it's happening. Let's talk about social justice because that's a huge issue as it relates it to the inner city. And you wrote such so well about it in the uh, in your book. But do you want to kind of talk about that just for a moment? Yeah, this is one of those things where data matters. Uh, I love my friend Ed Stetzer's statement: "Facts are our friends." And so I think it's important for us to look at facts and data concerning disparities in educational opportunities, uh, wealth in America, uh, employment opportunities. These things continue to remain uh, challenges. And, uh, and wherever we have as Americans, uh, in particular as Christians, wherever we have identified inequities, uh, injustices, and we've acknowledged and addressed them, progress has been made. One of my concerns that's happening in the church today is an unwillingness to hear the narrative that there may be disparities anywhere, that there may be barriers uh, anywhere. So, so let me just address this head on. There are two causal factors, two dominant causal factors in Scripture for poverty, two dominant causal factors. One is individual iniquity. The Bible, in particular, the book of Proverbs, talks about the fool, the sluggard, the individual who, because of their own immoral choices, brings about their own poverty. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. But the problem with uh, that narrative is that far too many see that as the sole causal factor for poverty and brokenness in a person's life, that if you would have just made better choices, you would be okay. Well, the Bible does not promote that as the only narrative. There is another narrative, and that is institutional injustice. This is when government behaves badly. This is when systems of justice uh, or law behave badly. This is when there's not a particular name or person you can point to, 
but an overall structural problem. There's examples of this throughout history or throughout biblical history. Nehemiah 13 is an example of government behaving badly. Uh, Nehemiah was very concerned and had to come back after the rebuilding and reinstitute reforms that have been corrupted since he was there. Ezekiel 22, a powerful chapter where God brings a case against Israel because they were oppressing the poor and the poor were not getting justice. So even the judges weren't giving the justice they should to the poor. We see examples of that in our day. For example, public defender's offices are terribly underfunded. If you do the research, what you find is that about 80% of the cases that are brought in court in America have defendants, criminal cases, have defendants that can't afford adequate legal representation. Now, a lot of those individuals end up being in prison simply because of their poverty, simply because they can't afford it. And just about every public defender's office across America will tell you that when states have to cut funding in any area, they're at the top of the list and they're trying to do as much as they can with being underfunded. Uh, another great chapter on this is Acts 6. Acts chapter 6, we see the church growing and exciting. Activity is happening, but a complaint rises among the Hellenistic Jews who are ethnic minorities by culture, by custom, uh, to the Hebraic Jews that were in leadership, the apostles and others. And what was the complaint? It was a complaint about economic injustice. The complaint was that the widows, the Hellenistic widows, were not being treated equally in a daily distribution of resources. Um, there was no individual named there. There was no uh, specific person. It was a structural thing. It was a broader institutional thing. And the apostles understood it. They created a, a, another leadership group, seven Greek Hellenistic leaders, Jewish Hellenist leaders that uh, came among them and helped to uh, share power. And so I just simply say, that the problem with our partisan politics bill is that one of these narratives are often cited as the total narrative. So you have those who will cite institutional injustice as the only problem in America that if we can fix institutions, there we will find our salvation. Well, that's not the gospel. Others will say it's all the individual needing to do better. Well, that's not the total picture either. We who are well-informed biblical Christians have to acknowledge both causal factors, individual mm -hmm. iniquity and institutional injustice, and we have to consistently address both. Thanks for listening to today's Breakpoint Podcast. Again, we have Chris Brooks's book, Urban Apologetics, at our online bookstore at breakpoint.org. We'll also link you to the urban ministry resources mentioned by Pastor Brooks. Just click on our podcast episode, which is also at breakpoint.org. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.